The Book of Mormon details two epic ancient journeys across the ocean from one continent to another. The first one happens at the beginning of the book and allegedly describes how the principal ancestors of the Native Americans came to the Western Hemisphere in around 600 BC. Oops, let me correct that. That's how these people came to the Americas and became among the ancestors of the Native Americans. I think that's how it goes now. Other content creators have described the impossible nature of this task in great detail. A great one is called How to Build a Transoceanic Vessel by John Larson. And it is fantastic, and you should check it out after this video. The second journey happens near the end of the book and describes how another group of people came to America around 2500 BC in wooden submarines. Welcome, friends, enemies, and everyone in between to my channel, The Masked Mormon. I am, in fact, The Masked Mormon. Why are you wearing a mask? Why you burn the acid or something like that? Oh no, it's just they're terribly comfortable. I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. I am a former Mormon who used to believe in the truth claims of the Mormon Church. Now I talk about Mormon doctrine, history, and culture on the internet with you fine viewers. Let's get into it. The Book of Mormon starts off in Jerusalem and has to find a way to get its characters to the Americas. All they have to do is build a ship using technology that didn't exist yet, with tools that, had, that they had no way of obtaining, and making a journey that would dwarf the accomplishments of the ancient Polynesians. The scale of the effort is often overlooked by believing members because they don't really understand the magnitude of the feat that is described in the book. Similarly, toward the end of the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Ether, another group of people depart from the Tower of Babel, apparently occurring around 2500 BC. They are led by a man named the Brother of Jared. The group comprises of Jared, this brother, their families, and their friends. They ask God not to confound their language, and because of their righteousness, God decides to lead them to a promised land. They journey in the wilderness, carrying with them animals, birds, swarms of bees, and even tanks containing fish. They eventually come to the sea, and Jesus appears to the brother of Jared and instructs him to build eight barges to carry his people, the Jaredites, to the promised land. The barges are described in the text as being the length of a tree, whatever that means, with peaked ends. There was a door on the side for loading that would be shut and sealed. Or, as it says in the text, it was tight, like unto a dish. I always kind of imagine them as big footballs. There's also a hole in the top and in the bottom that would be plugged up. The purpose of this hole was so that they could unstop it and let in fresh air when they needed it. But also, these barges could flip over due to wave action, meaning that the hole in the bottom would become the hole in the top. The text also says that the barges would at times become buried in the depths of the sea, meaning that these barges could submerge much like a submarine. Inside each of these ancient submarines were two glowing stones to provide light. When the brother of Jared was being told how to build these barges by Jesus, Jesus reached his finger to touch these 16 stones to make them glow. When the barges, or submarines, were ready, the people loaded their animals, supplies, and themselves into their vessels and set off into the ocean, being driven by the winds. These vessels drift for 344 days until they eventually land somewhere in the Americas. Now, there are a ton of problems with this story that make it an outlandish impossibility. If the brother of Jared's people were really able to build such vessels, they would have either sunk or they would have washed up on some shore somewhere, likely very far apart from one another, with everything inside being dead. But let's look into it in more detail, starting with the light source. The glowing stones were considered a miracle, so I won't really be considering them in as much detail, except to say that if God works according to natural laws, 
the only way to make a solid state material glow would to have been through the use of radioactive materials. Possibilities of glowing materials could be something like radium that glows a faint green. Other radioactive substances like uranium and plutonium don't really glow in a way that can be seen to the human eye. Though, when they are exposed to ultraviolet light, they do have a distinct glow. And in certain concentrations, like when they are refined for nuclear reactors, the ionizing radiation from uranium and plutonium exceeds the speed of light in air or in water, resulting in a blue glow called Cherenkov radiation. Now, don't get hung up on the exceeding the speed of light in air aspect. Light travels slower through a medium like air or water or glass than it does in a vacuum. The speed of light in a vacuum is still the fastest speed there is. But Cherenkov radiation is kind of like a supersonic aircraft creating a sonic boom. This is of course very dangerous unless you are protected by some sort of adequate shielding, which would not have been available to the occupants in a poorly ventilated space for nearly a year. The brother of Jared and his family and friends would have succumbed to something like radiation poisoning or maybe even cancer. Now let's get into the vessels themselves. These tree-sized, peak-ended, tight like unto a dish vessels were likely inspired by the barges that moved up and down the Erie Canal. The canal opened in 1825 and had a stop in Joseph Smith's hometown of Palmyra, New York. Joseph would have certainly seen these barges very often. These barges, which were drawn by horses, carried passengers and cargo throughout the region. Notice the peaked ends of these barges. These barges had no propulsion of their own. Like the Erie Canal barges, the ones described in the Book of Mormon also had no propulsion, except for the winds and ocean currents. As such, these Jaredite barges would have been really no different than large pieces of driftwood. And this presents a problem. Traditionally, it has been said by church leaders that the Jaredites set adrift from somewhere along the east coast of Asia or India. The currents there don't really go in the right direction. Also, since the barges had no sails, there wasn't a lot of surface area on which the wind could act. As they drifted depending on where they embarked from, they would have had to make their way through narrow passages and channels and to make their way into differing ocean basins. If they ended up in the Pacific, then the current would have taken them north and deposited them somewhere from Alaska to the Pacific Northwest. It is also difficult to move from current to current without some sort of power or propulsion. Instead, they would continually circle one of the many ocean gyres. Also, the likelihood of eight vessels from the Jaredite flotilla staying together is very remote. Imagine you set adrift eight large pieces of wood into the ocean. What do you imagine the chances are that they would all wash up in roughly the same location at roughly the same time within the Western Hemisphere within a year? Not saying that it's impossible to make the journey, but the timetable is very suspect. For instance, in 2011 in Japan, an earthquake struck that caused the tsunami that led to the Fukushima nuclear meltdown. This tsunami washed all sorts of debris out to sea including boats. In 2014, three years, one month, and seven days after the tsunami, a barnacle-encrusted boat washed up in Washington state. A journey of over 4,500 miles. It took over three years for this boat to make that journey. Now, it's difficult enough to maintain a group of sail-powered vessels in visual contact with one another while at sea, especially at night let alone unpowered drifting barges. Provisioning the vessels would have been the next challenge. A person can eat around 2,000 pounds of food a year. Similarly, a person should drink roughly a gallon of water per day, and each gallon weighs roughly 8 pounds. Multiply that by 344 days gives you roughly 2,800 pounds of water per person. If they had 10 to 20 people with them, that would be 10 to 20 tons of food and 14 to 28 tons of water. 
That would be about six tons of food and water per barge. That is food and water that you have to keep from spoiling or becoming contaminated, which, as we'll discuss further, will become impossible. Remember, there is no refrigeration or means of preserving food for that long, and the hot, humid climate would make things even more difficult. Also, barrels won't be invented for a very long time. So the skins or clay pots that were used at the time would not be durable enough to survive the trip. But you also have to remember that the Jaredites also brought animals with them. Now the text doesn't mention if they took their bees and fish with them, so let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they didn't. But the animals that they did bring would also need food and water that also need to be kept fresh. This could be up to 4 tons of food and 40 tons of water per animal. Now these barges are quickly becoming overloaded with goods that will be impossible to keep dry or uncontaminated. They would not have been light upon the water like they are described in the text. Their food would have become unsafe and started to rot long before they arrived at their destination. Similarly, their water would have become contaminated by the animal waste mold and bacteria, and the containers would not be durable enough to survive. Now there were ships that were built in Mesopotamia around this time. They were made of lashed together plant matter or even of wood. To make them watertight, the hull would be covered with a substance called bitumen. Now this was really the only substance available to the people of this time. Bitumen is essentially a tar, and the fumes that this gave off in a sealed, hot enclosure would have become toxic. What's more, it's necessary to reapply bitumen occasionally to refill the gaps in the wood planks. To do this, old bitumen needs to be scraped off and new bitumen needs to be applied, but it has to be heated with a fire to make it soft enough so that it can be applied. And the Book of Ether specifically says that there was no fire on the barges. With the inability to reseal the hull while drifting, seawater would have begun to leak into the vessels causing issues with contamination and leading to the eventual loss of the vessel. Now recall that there is an opening on the top of the vessel and on the bottom of the vessel. These openings were covered and sealed and opened to let in fresh air when needed. Sealing these openings when closed would be difficult for the same reasons I explained before about sealing the hull but worse since they would have to be removed often. Additionally, the hole in the bottom would be especially challenging to seal. This hole would be under the water line and thus exposed to much more water pressure. For each 30 feet you descend into the water, the pressure increases by another atmosphere. If the bottom of the barge is only, say, I don't know, 10 feet below the surface, that's an extra third of an atmosphere or roughly an extra 5 PSI added onto the ambient 14 PSI. That would be roughly 20 PSI acting on the bottom plug. Now if we assumed a 10 square foot opening, something that's not that large, the plug would have had to hold back over 28,000 pounds of force. And that is before these barges even submerge below the waves, which only exacerbates the problem. Now you may be aware of the submersible that imploded when visiting the Titanic in 2023. Water pressure is no joke. With all of this considered, it would be impossible to keep seawater out of the barges. Now this is even true with modern ships. Water will leak in from various places, and it settles in the lowest part of the ship. This is called the bilge. Now this bilge water needs to be removed somehow. This can be accomplished by bailing with buckets, which would mean you would need to open the top hole, or some sort of pumping mechanism, which won't be invented for a very long time. In addition to bilge water, the removal of human and animal waste would be a paramount problem. This would be a continual issue that would lead to contamination of drinking water and of the food. Water contamination would lead to things like typhoid fever, cholera, giardia, dysentery, E. coli, hepatitis, and salmonella all potentially fatal if untreated and certain to happen in this environment. 
Now just think back to your Oregon Trail days when someone in your party would die of dysentery. Breathing would have also become very difficult. Opening the stopped hole in the top would not be enough to provide adequate ventilation. Modern ships use scoops to force air down into the hull for ventilation purposes. Now this would not have been possible on these barge submarine things. The conditions inside the hull would very quickly become deadly. The fumes from the bitumen sealing the hull, the carbon dioxide breathed out by the people and the animals, and the gases that build up due to feces would make these barges incapable of supporting life very quickly. For instance, carbon dioxide is heavier than air and would settle to the lowest parts of the barges, poisoning or asphyxiating the people and the animals inside. In heavy seas or when the barges are submerged, the people inside would likely not last for more than an hour or two. Now we complicate things further by submerging the barges. We already touched on the increased pressure when discussing the holes in the top and the bottom of the barges. Submarines are very hard to build for a very good reason. Water pressure will find any weak spot and force water into the interior. At worst, the structure doesn't hold up to the pressure and ultimately implodes, killing everyone on board. The pressure from going down even a moderate amount easily applies tens to hundreds of thousands of pounds of force on the hull, weakening and eventually destroying the barge. This weakening will add up over time with each cycle of surfacing and submerging, adding more and more damage that would eventually lead to the loss of the vessel. Then the barges have the ability to flip over in the waves. There's a hole in the bottom that then becomes the hole in the top for just that purpose. Now imagine that you are in an enclosed space with your family, several potentially very large animals, thousands of pounds of food and water, feces, urine, and bilge water when all of a sudden your barge turns over completely. The floor is now the ceiling. Your animals have all fallen, potentially becoming injured or killed. You and your family have all fallen. The food and water are spilled and covered in a mixture of seawater, urine, and feces. In the fall, perhaps the hull is damaged or the bitumen seal is compromised. So how does this sound to you? With all the incessant rocking and unpredictable flipping, and unlivable conditions inside, it sounds a lot like hell to me. And as the barges move through the tropics, it would have been extremely hot and humid inside the barges. And if they passed into the northern Pacific or Atlantic during the winter, conditions would have been unbearably cold. And without the ability to make fire for warmth, it is likely, it is unlikely anyone would have survived. So to sum up, the problems with the Jaredite's voyage include problems with the glowing rocks, issues with ocean currents and the time to make the crossing, food and water supply and contamination issues, seawater leakage, water pressure and hull strength issues, deadly fumes and ventilation, problems with submerging, and problems with flipping over. Now it's pretty obvious from this analysis that this story as described in the Book of Mormon would be impossible. Technological limitations of the time, weather, and physical limitations would make this an untenable journey. If they were even able to construct the barges in the first place, no one would have survived to make it to the Americas. So what other problems do you think there would be? What did I miss? If you are a believer, how do you reconcile the fantastical nature of this story? Let me know down in the comments. And if you like what I do, please press the like button and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.